Well, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to Monday. Uh, yesterday, we lost our our streaming service during the about the ten minutes into our service yesterday. Uh, one of our little uh, boxes that handles all the uh, recording equipment coming in went kaput, and so uh, it died on us. And I apologize for that. We're we got a replacement coming, and hopefully, we'll be all good to go uh, for this week. But I was on my first sermon of the sermon series, so I thought it'd be important that. I go ahead and re-record this thing for you so you all could be on the same page as where we are going forward. So if you remember, over the past month, we walked through a series that discussed how God seeks us out, especially when we're standing alone. And we explored some of the heroes of the Bible, like uh, uh, Jacob and Joshua and Gideon and Elijah. And in each of these stories, we saw men who were bewildered and uncertain about what to do. So God came to them to provide insight, and, and God transforms them, in many cases, into powerful leaders. So I thought it'd be good to bring you a different type of series, one that demonstrates the difference between men and women in the Bible. And if you spend any time in Scripture, you'll notice a significant difference in how God works through women compared to men. If I had to be specific, I'd say that God nurtures men, but expects women to act right away. So if you think about it, most notable men in the Bible are nudged by God into doing great things. He comes in, he prods them, and then they push back a little bit, and they whine, and then he pushes them a little bit. Women, on the other hand, they don't wait for God. They just go out and start doing things. They go out and do great things, and, and God rewards them for their faith. Now, if you'll join me, I want to turn in our scripture this morning, on Monday, uh, to Exodus uh, chapter 1, verses 15 to 21. That's where we're going to be reading from. But let me give you a little bit of the backstory. In Exodus, uh, this is where we discover that after Joseph came to power in Egypt, all 70 members of his extended family moved to Egypt due to the famine, and they stayed. And their families expanded and then grew. And long after the Egyptian rulers have forgotten about Joseph and his great deeds, they began to worry about the massive number of Hebrews in the land. And scripture says they multiplied greatly, increased in numbers, and became so numerous the land was filled with them. When we learn that when the new Pharaoh comes to power, he didn't, he probably knows of Joseph, but he didn't, you know, he doesn't really care about his history. He's the new Pharaoh. But what he is concerned about is the allegiance of those Hebrews. Who will they side with if times get bad? And in and, and the scripture it says we must deal shrewdly with them or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, they will join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. So the Pharaoh had uh, very, a lot of concern about what the Hebrews would do when pitted against the Egyptians themselves. So we have this massive number of Hebrews in uh, Egypt was a problem. So the Pharaoh decides he's going to break the spirit of the Hebrews. And he enslaves them. And he puts them to work, uh, just awful uh, conditions, very cruel labor. He sends them to big, two other big cities. But what did you know? It didn't break the Hebrew spirit at all. In fact, their population continues to grow. So the Pharaoh now is getting desperate. And he decides it's time to do something even more brutal. And that's where we're going to pick up in verse 15. So Exodus 1, verse 15, it says, The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, who names were Shipra and Pua. When you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, let her live. Now, who all knows what a midwife is? I imagine there are some of you folks watching, maybe you even had an at-home birth. Uh, I know uh, in church yesterday we had four or five people raise their hand that they had been born at home. And a lot of people don't realize that before 1940, most children were born at home with a midwife assisting. Now, in ancient Egypt, midwives were highly respected community members. They delivered the babies, they used herbal remedies, and the Egyptian midwives, they would invoke the gods of motherhood to protect the mothers of the newborns and the newborns. Um, and so in this context, we can see that Shipra and Pua were the chief midwives for the Hebrew people. And that's why the Pharaoh called on them to help him in his, his devious plan to reduce the Hebrew male population. Now, if you remember from about a month ago, I mentioned that it's essential to understand the meanings behind the names in the Bible. And today, right away, we were introduced to two ladies, one named Shipra, the other one's name is Pua. 
Now, that name Shipra is actually found in a list of slaves in Egypt during the reign of a pharaoh back in 1745 BC. So we know it's a legitimate name. We know that there was a slave. Uh, this adds a credibility to the story. Um, but when we actually look at her name, we see that the verb tense of her name means to be peacefully or harmoniously calm. And the noun version of her name means fairness or clearness. The second midwife, whose name was Pua, and in her case, the Hebrew uh, verb for her name means to shine or radiate. And the noun tense of the, ver of the word means to be uh, brightness or splendor. So here we are at the beginning of Exodus, and we have Shipra and Pua, who are commanded by the Pharaoh to kill all the boys that are born to the Hebrew women. What do you think they do? When we looked at the, the men in our stories over the last month, they, uh, they usually ran off and hid somewhere, right? Um, so do these women, do they dig a hole in the ground like Gideon did to escape from the Midianites? Are they doing that to hide from the Pharaoh? Or, or do they hang their heads and they go climb a mountain and sit in a cave waiting for God to come along like Elijah did? Well, the answer is no, they didn't do any of this stuff. You see, Pharaoh called the wrong two women. Remember their names? One's calm and clear-headed, and the other one's a beautiful, bright, radiant light. And the reality is, if, if these two women had been asked by the Pharaoh to do this, if, you know, if they spoke Yiddish back in the day, I bet they probably would have said something like, eh, Meshuggah, you know, that's insanity. What, what, what is it you're actually asking us to do? So it, we get to verse 17. It says, the midwives, however, feared God and did not want the king of Egypt, did not, and did not want to do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Okay, so these midwives said, Meshuggah, that's crazy stuff. We're going to let these boys live. Now, not to trivialize their actions, um, they openly disobeyed the ruler of Egypt. They knew they could probably put to death for what they did not do. They were taking the risk for their own lives to save these newborn boys. But the text tells us they didn't merely deliver the boys. They actively ensured that they let the boys live. Now, there's a, a Jewish midrash that's a, it's a form of old traditional storytelling, and it talks about the story, and it explains that if the midwives encountered poor women, they would collect food and water from wealthier households to ensure that these impoverished mothers could care for their children. So Shipra and Pua did more than just refrain from killing the boys. They literally ensured these boys thrived. And isn't that what God expects all of us when he puts his will in our hearts, when he asks us to do something? We're not called to just meet the basic needs, but to help others thrive, right? So what does the Pharaoh do when he discovers that the Hebrew population hasn't declined? Well, we get to verse 18. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked him, why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? Well, how do you think they answered? Remember, these are not two ordinary women. They're calm, they're radiant, they're shrewd. But they also do something that many people who read scripture would find a little bit controversial or maybe even unethical. They go Pinocchio. They lie like Pinocchio. The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwives arrive. So they concoct this uh, crazy story about how they never get a chance to get to the boys because, well, they just don't get there in time. Those Hebrew women, you know, they're just so tough. They don't spend much time in a birthing chair. They, they just pop those kids out and get right back to work. Aren't, aren't you lucky, Pharaoh? So I mentioned some people find this verse a little bit unethical. I mean, after all, aren't we taught that there's no such thing as a small lie? Uh, little white lies are lies. All fibs are the same in Jesus' eyes. So how does God square this blatant lie with the two midwives? Well, there's two places in the Bible where we see God forgive the sin of false witness. Here, and in the story of Rahab, the prostitute in Jericho, she lied to the soldiers to help the two spies escape. And God honors Rahab as a result. Her actions were considered as a, an act of faith rather than sin. So the same thing happens here. God considers Shipper and Pua to be the work of the sanctity of life, not the destruction. In fact, God not only dismisses their fake story as a sin, he rewards the two of them. Exodus uh, 1 verse 20 says, So God was kind to the midwives, and the people increased and became even more numerous. 
And because the midwives, verse 21, and because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. So not only does God excuse them, he rewards them for their faith. In verse 21, we actually discover that the two midwives most likely were previously not able to bear children. So God rewards them with a family of their own. So you got to understand, for, for women of the era, there was no greater blessing than the security provided by a large number of children. And Shipra and Pua, they were living fully to God's plan for his chosen people to multiply and thrive. Well, the question is, why were the midwives willing to risk their lives? And the answer is, way back in verse 17, it said that they feared God. Now, if you remember the story of Abraham being willing to sacrifice his son Isaac, and you know that he stopped at the very last minute, God told him to stop. In fact, here's what the, in Genesis uh, chapter 22, verse 12 says. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. This was the credo that the Hebrew people lived to, to fear God. And th that doesn't mean afraid of punishment. Fearing God means having a reverence for him that greatly impacts the way you live. The fear of God is uh, respecting him, obeying him, submitting to his discipline, and worshiping him in awe. If there is any true fear of God, that would be to lose favor in God's eyes, you know, that, that God would no longer care about you. And now in the case of Shipra and Pua, it means doing what you know is right without hesitation. And unlike the men of the Bible, not waiting for God to help you make that difficult decision. I always try to tell you that you should try to find ourselves in Scripture. And this story is a good example because we all encounter pharaohs in our life. There are people that put us in challenging situations and circumstances that just seem overwhelming. Sometimes the pharaohs are our bosses at work or our supervisors, and sometimes the pharaohs are our coworkers and are our friends. <coughs> sometimes it's just public opinion. We've seen the cancel culture used as a pharaoh for people of prominence. The reality is pharaoh has a purpose in our lives. While facing pain and adversity can be tough, they act as a form of, let's call it strength training. They help us develop resilience so we can live more effectively for God. So when we know we're facing a Pharaoh, we can grow in our certainty that what we're doing is for God's glory and not our own and certainly not for some malevolent cause. So I wanna tell you another story about a woman who faced a common Pharaoh uh, of a more modern time um, some of you have probably heard about the drug uh, thalidomide. Some of you had in, in church yesterday. We probably had a half a dozen folks that had heard of thalidomide. Well, in the late 1950s, thalidomide was touted as a, a miracle drug uh, for treating morning sickness in pregnant women. Uh, it was developed by a company in Germany, and um, it was originally prescribed as a sedative, but pretty soon it was given to pregnant women to alleviate nausea. And in 1960, uh, by that point in time, it was widely used all over Europe and across the world. And the pharmaceutical company uh, behind that drug, they aggressively promoted its safety and its effectiveness. And this led to even more countries like Canada and the UK to uh, approve it very quickly. So the company was pretty anxious to get the drug approved in the United States. But even more, thousands of women had heard about this miracle drug that would stop the dreaded pains of morning sickness. Now, if you remember, uh, the 1950s were the beginning of the what generation? The baby boomer generation, right? Everyone was getting pregnant, and that meant a lot of morning sickness. What women, what, I mean, what woman would want, not want to take a pill to feel better, right? But there was only a problem. Or should I say, there was a woman that stood in the way. And her name was Dr. Frances Oldham Kelsey, and she worked for, at the uh, U.S. Food and Drug Administration, the FDA. And it turns out Dr. Frances Kelsey was a meticulous scientist, and she started to evaluate the data for th thalidomide. And what she did is she discovered an alarming number of discrepancies in the data that the manufacturer provided, especially around the areas of safety testing. Now, Dr. Kelsey, she was uh, especially worried about uh, potential side effects. 
uh, including irreversible nerve damage and the unknown impact on pregnant women and their unborn children. And as you can imagine, the pharmaceutical company was not happy. The FDA bosses were feeling pressure, and they were not happy. Her own colleagues and friends dismissed her concerns, and they were not happy. And heck, millions of women across the United States were not happy. Let's go just to prove the drug, will ya? But Dr. Kelsey stood firm. She emphasized the need for rigorous testing before approval. She was determined to protect the most innocent among us, those little babies, boys and girls. And wouldn't you know it, while she advocated for caution, reports of severe birth defects linked to thalidomide started to come in and surface from these other countries where the drug was already being used for over a decade. Now remember, this is the days before the internet and news traveled fairly slowly. But reports came out that nearly 10,000 children were born with a birth defect called Focomelia. And Focomelia is a significant uh, disease that has uh, significant limb deformities in children's hands and feet. Sometimes the babies are born with a cleft palate or abnormal or missing ears or kidney problems or heart problems and digestive disorders and, and even defects of the spinal cord. So this emerging evidence validated Dr. Kelsey's insistence on further investigation. So by the end of 1961, the drug had been withdrawn from the markets of both West Germany and the United Kingdom. But because of her dedication to thorough testing of thalidomide, Dr. Kelsey helped the U.S. avoid the tragedy that the other nation experienced. Tens of thousands, if not millions of children born with birth defects. And President John Kennedy awarded her the Gold Medal Award for Distinguished civil, uh, Civilian Service. See, because Dr. Kelsey was, didn't bow to the pharaohs in her life, the FDA and the pharmaceutical companies, the pharmaceutical companies had to withdraw the drugs, and the FDA was forced to make crucial reforms in drug safety regulations. They, they were forced to make reforms to how they evaluate drugs that impact us here in our life today. Now, Dr. Kelsey, she worked at the FDA all the way up into her 90s, and she died last year in 2023 at the age of 101. Now, I'm curious, when she died, did any of you hear stories about this courageous woman that battled with the FDA on the evening news? Did you hear the stories about how she went up against Big Pharma and she kept millions of Americans safe? Probably not. I don't remember hearing a single story about Dr. Kelsey. And sadly, there's too many stories of women all throughout history who fight against the pharaohs in their lives and they changed the world and no one ever hears about it. Let me ask you a question. How many of you knew the story of Shipra and Pua before this sermon? See what I mean? The Bible has lessons for all of us, and we're called to find ourselves in these stories. So like Shipper and Pua, we're called to stand firm on our faith, to listen to what God puts on our heart, and to act courageously, even when the world's trying to push us in another direction. We all have to do our best to not be swayed by the pressures of society or the voices that seek to undermine our faith. Instead, we have to tune our ears to God's whispers and boldly pursue his calling on our lives. The Apostle Paul reminds us in Romans 12 too, do not conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So this week, I'm gonna challenge you all to identify the pharaohs in your life. What pressures are you facing? What, what is God asking you to do? So this is your time to be brave. This is your chance to stand up to those who want to dismiss you. Those that want to discount your calling. Those that want to put you under their thumb and steal your faith in Christ. So as we navigate these challenges, remember, we don't walk on this path alone. We have a friend in Jesus. Yesterday we sang that, uh, that song uh, as our middle hymn because the words are true. He walks with us through every trial and tribulation. He's our comforter. He's our guide. 
He's always ready to listen and support you. So as we face our Pharaohs this week, let's bring our burdens to Christ. He, he invites us to lay them down, trusting in his unfailing love and guidance. Let's lift our hearts in gratitude for the friendship we have in Christ. He empowers us to, to face our challenges with courage and faith. He calls on us all to be a Shipra and a Pua. And the thing is, we have this promise of God with us because God sent his son who died on the cross so that we may live. And all we have to do is believe in him. And we're given a gift of an abundant life here on earth as it is in heaven and the promise of an eternal life beside our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let me close in prayer for today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this important message to, and this opportunity to stop, take our moment, and reflect on the powerful women that have gone before us and blaze the trail where sometimes men didn't want to pursue. And just how blessed we are to have all these strong women who live courageously in their faith because they know that the fear of God, the fear of you not being present in our lives, is greater than any other fear any Pharaoh could throw at us. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your message. And it's in your son's precious name we pray. Amen. So again, sorry about the little mess up with the streaming uh, yesterday. Uh, get, hopefully we'll have it fixed for you this week. If it doesn't, I'll see you Monday afternoon with another recap of the sermon. God bless you, everybody. Have a great night.